Welcome back to The Color of Money. Uh, today we're doing something that I think is going to be absolutely instrumental for our listeners, which is actually knowing your worth. Um, I know Khaled, the, the artist, makes a song or has made a song, Know Your Worth, right? But we're talking about your actual net worth. And so I have my wonderful co-host with me today, uh, Mr. Emmerich Peace, Miss Julia Lachey. Welcome, you guys. Good to see you. Hey. Yes, yes. We're going to be dumping in, jumping into, I know we've talked about a lot of principles over the last few episodes around what is, like, how do we grow our net worth or your net work is your net worth and so on. But today we're going to go all the way back to the foundational steps of this on actually calculating and understanding what is your net worth. One of my sayings is what you measure, you move. And so it's important that every first of the month we start looking into that net worth tracker, um, understanding what that is and monitoring this journey of looking at your net worth, goal setting it, gamifying it, and growing it. So Emmerich, what would you, what do you think in in your opinion is is, is the most important piece, or not the most important I guess, but what do you think is the important piece on on understanding your net worth? Why is it so important for people? Well, here's what I did not understand before and I understand now. When you don't have money, it's no reason to keep track of money because you don't have anything to keep track of. And yeah. so in that space, visit your money often. What happens, in, and this is what happens to most of us, when you don't have money, you're not going to keep looking at your account to keep reinforcing that it's empty. And when you do have money, you want to keep looking at your account to reinforce that it's full. And so in that space, what we have to really understand is you have to visit your money often and you have to hold your money accountable, and you have to be accountable to your money. And that's huge, Daniel, because so many times when you don't, if you ever listen to someone who's lost their wealth, they will tell you, I didn't realize how much money I was spending because I wasn't paying attention to it. Yeah, They will say it all the time. I, I just wasn't. I, I thought it was an infinite stream. <laughs> and it's not an infinite stream. It's an infinite stream going out until it's empty, and it's not an infinite stream coming in because you still have to do the activities to continuously bring in unless you're in a residual place where your residual is infinite, and most of us aren't in that place. Not yet, at least, right? Right. Yeah, no. We, we, we're not Amazon, right? <laughs> <laughs> But now, it's, even it's a, Daniel, even backing up, I think backing up a step is I, I've learned that a lot of people don't even know what net worth is. You're asking Emmerich yeah. a question that's even a step past what net worth is. I saw a girl post on Facebook, a girl I know. She said something about the goal. I was looking for it. I was just looking for it, so I didn't misquote her. But she said something to the extent that the, the goal was for her assets to equal her liabilities uh, or something like that. And I'm like, you realize that means you have mm. nothing. Right. right. That's what that yeah. means. That means zero. Right. And that, I, that, and means, I you're out, that means you're that means you're out of debt. That that's it. And and that's it. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you actually have any net worth. You're just not negative. Right. So right. I realized though in that moment that there are a lot of people that don't even know what net worth means. Right. It actually means that what your assets, whatever your assets might be, maybe you have a checking account or uh, real estate properties or whatever. Maybe you got $10 under your pillow. That is an asset, right? Whatever your assets are, minus your liabilities, what you owe people. You know, if you have a house, your mortgage. Or if if you uh, have student loans or those kind of things. So what you have minus what you owe people, that, friends, is what we mean by net worth. Even that element, that basic element, a lot of people don't understand that when we talk net worth, that's that's what that means. Assets minus liabilities. And and then and unfortunately, um, you know, you speaking in this conversation, there's uh, uh, I wasn't prepared with all my stats. Y'all know I like to have a bunch of stats. But un- unfortunately, with net worth, um, we already know. Obviously, the reason we have this podcast is because the black net worth is so substantially different um, than white net worth. But uh, for a lot of people in our community, particularly um, women or single people, it is a negative number. Your net worth is is negative. Uh, is because you owe $100,000 in student loans, you know, or you owe whatever that is. When you, when you take your assets minus your liabilities, you're, you're in the red. 
Uh, and that's really the starting place of the conversation is like, like Emmerich was saying, some, some people don't have a lot of money to even count, you know, but uh, understanding that that's the whole nature of this conversation that, that we're having today. Yeah. And well, even with that, a lot of people don't understand they may be in a negative net worth situation and they're still living good. Yeah. Because their cash flow is working for them and, and they, they're, then it's not truly disposable income. It's, I'm, I'm going to call it for lack of a better term, spendable money. Their their spending habits don't change because money in, money out. Well, we do this with our with our agents on our team. The average agent, we have about 30, 32 agents on our team, and the average age, age is somewhere around 28, 29 years old. And when we start this with our team, they hate this process because when you start, when you really evaluate, not how you feel or what you think you have, but you really evaluate where exactly I'm at, all of my, my jewelry, my car, any houses that I own, my checking accounts, savings accounts, investment accounts, and so on, minus the debt that you have equals mm -hmm. a number. When we start looking at this and, and people start at zero or in the negative in, 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 in a lot of situations, it's daunting and it's, 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 for some people it's embarrassing. And I think for, for me, it was, it was exciting for me when I was negative because I was like, Damn, I got I got to get going because when I, my first my first time doing this when my coach had me do it seven eight years ago was I think we we're like negative seventy five and negative eighty thousand living comfortably though, but it completely right. changed the 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 mindset of what are we growing and what do I want to become, and why does it matter how much money I'm making every month if I'm making twenty thousand a month and I'm spending eighteen thousand, I'm only net two thousand positive, and that that. That trajectory for people, as we, as we get into this and understand, as your income increases, your expenses can't increase at that same rate. If they do, you're not making anything. We've got to live broke as our income spikes to create a really big difference between the two numbers. And that's how you start seeing your net, your net worth grow rapidly. And, you, and that, that's a great point, Daniel. I was, I was speaking to some folks last week, and part of our dialogue was that Tomorrow does not exist. Mm -hmm. It just does. It doesn't exist. I said, however, today you have to do everything possible to prepare yourself just in case tomorrow comes. And so in that space, you cannot spend all of your money today because if tomorrow comes, you're going to be broke. And that was a part of our dialogue. You know, kind of sort of that same that, and that resonated with them because it, that's the reality. If we do every, if we spend everything we have today, tomorrow comes, we're broke. What are we going to do? Guess what? You have to make the same amount of money every day in order to maintain your lifestyle or just to maintain your life. And that's just not a way to, that's not a way to live. And so understanding that idea of net worth, net worth and that accumulation and just because you're living well doesn't mean it correlates to a true net worth. That's going to move yeah. the needle for you in the future. When I think a lot of when we when we look at doing this and we look at our I'll share a net worth tracker that, that we use inside of my companies and the first one that I essentially started with. And a lot of the big debt that a lot of young folks have is student loans. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. is student loans good debt or bad debt? It depends on what you're using it for at this point in your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because we know all that money wasn't necessarily going to school, right? We were taking right, those loans right. out and doing some of the fun stuff. A exactly. End of the semester activities. <laughs> After you get your rebate check, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And so when we think about good debt versus bad debt, um, what are some examples, Julia and Amber, what are some examples of good debt? I, I would call good debt to be um, uh, a mortgage or a note that you hold on a piece of real estate, an, an asset that you have. Mm -hmm. um, I would call that good debt. Um, yeah. Also, if you had this conversation with other people, they some people think that you should have no debt. Like, right, that's Dave, Ram Dave Ramsey's model is a no debt yep. model, right? But, uh, mm -hmm. but there is some element I would think that you would – there's a lot of strategies we use in real estate that you leverage the debt that you have on properties. So for me, right. that would be that would be something that would be good debt would be for sure um, something that is contributing to an investment or an asset that you have that's going to grow. Yeah, and I think the when we think when we talk about good debt versus bad debt, good debt for the most part is long 
long-term fixed rate, somewhat low payment. And so when you think about putting money uh, down payments, especially looking at your, your primary residence and being able to buy a home like that and be on that long, long-term long fixed rate, then now we have the ability for that asset to be paid off over time, to grow in value over time, and all the tax advantages that we have, A, as real estate professionals, and B, just as consumers by being able to write off some of the interest and some of the uh, additional expenses you have even on investment properties. Mm-hmm. Now, Uncle Emmerich, what are the, what's the bad debt? This is where people. This is where people live live the most of their time, right? Right, exactly. That is acquired on non appreciating objects, not assets, because it's not an asset if it's non non if it's not appreciating, or debt that is accu- accumulated or debt that has uh, occurred through activities that do not create a positive cash flow. Yeah. So some examples of that: credit cards car loans, um, personal loans, uh, what else? Um, oh, I'm drawing Time a blank sh- right now. Time shares. Time shares. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. And so short-term high interest debt is bad debt. So when we think about the first step with all of this is understanding what that number is. All of your assets, all the things that you own, minus all the debt that you have creates a number. And then the focus for for a lot of us as we get into this is now saying, okay, well, I have a little bit of extra money. Now, where do I attack? And we attack the bad debt. We attack the credit cards. We attack the car loans. We attack the personal loans. And we don't, I know this is, this is different than Dave Ramsey that says, you know, accelerate the payoff on your home and don't have a mortgage payment. But a lot of people that, that are in my circles that I've grown up with have, have taught me that that good debt and leveraging real estate that then can create cash flow, that then can give you tax advantages over an extended period of time, is the way that we should be investing in the way that we should be spending our money. Well, Daniel, wouldn't that apply? Does part of that come into play? It depends on where you are in your life cycle. Because what do you mean? That, well, <clears throat> if you are over 55, do you believe that you should be paying down your debt a little more? Because... As you get over 50, uh, health crisis come up, you, life becomes less predictable. Let me just put it that way. And as you get closer to 60 and above, I, this is just this is the world according to Emmerich. As you get to 60 and above, I kind of think you should, even your house debt, maybe you should re- be paying that off also. Because once you get to that point of 62, worse come to worse. You have catastrophic health failure. And let's say all of your income drops and your primary residence is paid off. You can pay taxes and utilities off of Social Security if all of the wheels fall off of everything that you have. Well, so that's, while y'all were sitting here. I don't While know. y'all were sitting here talking, I've been I've been looking up all these numbers and stats, and it's interesting you mentioned that, Emmerich, because one of the graphs I'm looking at has uh, net worth by age, right? Um, but but all, while you're saying these things that come up in life as you age, also as you age, you continue to collect assets and make more money and have a larger income. So the the I'll use averages instead of medians. Uh, I'll use medians. Medians more realistic, right? Right. Uh, the median net worth of somebody um, under 35 is 13000 okay? It continues to go up, of course, as you get pa- older. Pa- let's pause there. 13000 yes. under 30 years old. Oh, don't. That's there, crazy. There, wait, that's but there's. crazy. And that's because a lot of those people are married. When we're talking about single people, it's 1300 <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Okay. So wait, but but as you get older, of course, these numbers change drastically. Going up to the age range you're talking about, 65 to 74, the average net worth, we're using medians, right? Medians. The median net worth for a 65 to 74 year old is 266,000. It continues to go up as you age, but of course, as we know, in the nature of this conversation, uh, that, that, that there's a, a lot of things that attribute to that. Your point of paying off well, stuff. I think that one of the main reasons that it that it grows so rapidly as they get older, not rapidly, but it grows as they get older is because of real estate. 
I was just about to say the main reasons are because the people in the younger ages have student le- student loan debt. That's really the only thing that throws them off. And the other thing is that they don't own enough property. They talked about people in that age range of 35 to 44. The only reason they had a significant net worth increase was because they bought property. Period. Because they bought property. Yeah. That's astonishing. Yeah. Yep, so that's when, what it was. So the people who didn't have a lot of net worth in that age range, 34 uh, to, to whatever it was, 35 to 44, was because they had a lot of student loan debt and they didn't yep. buy property. The people who bought property were in a very different position than them. Very different. And so the earlier... The other interesting so you, thing, last thing I'll throw out about stat, the other interesting thing is it talks about people who do have an education, though, a college education, making four times that of people who don't have a college education. But that is only for white families. If we're talking about black families, the wealth disparity is even larger amongst people who are highly educated, right? So your education level as a black American is irrelevant. The only way you're building net worth in that space is through real estate. Wow. That's the interesting thing. So it'd be fair to say that the earlier that you can get your hands on an asset or a home, then the better off that you're going to be as you get into your mid-30s and 40s and that later phase of life then, right? And all the way up until where it's talking about the age range as they go up to, uh, of course, um, having it just continues to increase the older they get. But primarily this whole thing, and there's tons of resources and information. And in case somebody cares, I'm reading financebuzz.com. Um, but it really is the acquisition of real property um, is the key driver for wealth in any community. And those of you that are listening, the minimum down payment you need to buy your first home is $0. Wait, 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 hold on, wait, wait, say it again, say it again. The minimum down payment you need for your first home is zero dollars. I have a quick story on this, and this is this is dear to my heart because way, my mother just bought her way. first house. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And we helped my mom through one of the programs we have with my mortgage company, and it's a zero dollar, zero down uh, loan that we have, um, zero dollars down, down payment assistance. It's a grant that you get that you never have to repay after you move into the home. We got the seller to pay all of her closing costs. My mom literally got her $75 back that she paid for her first time education uh, class for that house, used none of her actual own money to buy the home. And we have these programs that are these programs all across the country. That when you poll the amount of renters that think you need, the amount of renters, like 62% or 63% of renters think you need 20% down to buy a home. When there's these products out there that can really get you into a piece of real estate in your early to mid-20s, that you can have stability in your life that's growing over time, and then you leverage that to buy the next house and so on, if you guys plant the seeds right now and water them over the next five to ten years, you're going to have an ab- abundant garden uh, that you can go maintenance over time. Well, and Daniel, we, since we're talking about that, that whole conversation of net worth, there are two things I would like to do. Number one, um, this conversation about purchasing real estate and getting engaged in investment opportunities, we have to have we have to make sure that we're having that conversation in early, early twenties. Because the reality yeah. is that when you have it at twenty twenty one, they may or may not be listening to you. By the time they're twenty five, it's probably gonna settle in a little bit more. By the time they're twenty six or twenty seven, they're probably going to act on it. That's that one. The How other th- old were y'all when you bought your first house? I was 21. Ooh, that's a good job, Emmick. I was 25. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was 20. How old were you, Julia? I was 18, and I was my own realtor. It was the worst transaction ever. I was a oh, hot wow. man. It was my first transaction. <laughs> It was my first transaction, and I was my own realtor, and it was the first time I bought a house, the whole thing. I got, we could do a whole podcast on what not to do, but, yeah. uh, but I knew I needed to buy a house. I knew that much. Well, you, you learn. You learn. Yeah. That, that's, it wasn't a hot mess. It was a, it was a hot lesson. <laughs> <laughs> it was a hot lesson. It was a hot lesson. Well, well, 
the other part but the of the reality Daniel, is also while we're just while we're pushing the home ownership and we're making it seem like all you got to do to you know build your net worth is just buy a property as young as you can. The reality of that was there are a lot of responsibilities that come with that as well. You might be able to get in it with no money, like Daniel's saying. At that time, I didn't. I had to use I used down payment assistance. I had to get my three percent up. I still had to put a substantial amount of money I saved, you know. But I what I what I what I wasn't prepared for were some of the responsibilities that came with that. I remember sitting on the floor. I called my brother because I got a water bill, and I was crying. And I was like, they want me to pay for the water. You know, <laughs> it was like, yeah, you got to pay for the water. So also, while I want to just make sure, while we absolutely believe that uh, people should purchase real estate as soon as you're able to, um, realistically understand the responsibilities because we also want you to be able to sustain that property and keep that property uh, as well. That's a, that's just a little snippet. We'll make sure we're not putting out any false narratives there. It's, it comes with some responsibilities. Well, and you have, you have the, you have the hacks as, as well on being able to have a home warranty, cover all the major appliances, furnace, water heater, AC, um, sewage and all the rest of that stuff too at a somewhat of a minimal cost. So there's are hacks that you yeah. can have to ensure yourself and protect yourself over the big expenses of home ownership. Um, and I mean, I, I'm a home ownership gives you a little bit more stability in the sense of if you hit a hard time, like if you don't pay your rent, you get that eviction notice on the third, <laughs> you're late on the third, you're, you're getting pushing for the eviction on the fifth where through home ownership, if you go through an illness or you have some financial hardships, you can sometimes work with your lender and they can do a, 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 um, a, a loan modification for you. You can some in some states it takes a really long time to foreclose if you haven't made a payment. So there's some there, there's there's more stability and more help for homeowners than there are for renters as well. And it's the it's the it's the fastest way outside of being a tech entrepreneur to grow your net worth. Yes. And Daniel, the other part was that you said with your mortgage company, you helped your mom, correct? Yes, sir. So now this is a shameless plug. Can your mortgage company help other people in other parts of the country or can they only help people in in Colorado? That's a really good question because every state has their own specific down payment assistance programs. Right. But the one that we have, we're a broker and we, um, we can use this program in just about every state across the country. And so, so if we are not licensed in that state, we can get you connected with a broker that has access to the same program and that can still utilize the same opportunity, even if it's not through my company, because we're not licensed in all 50 states yet. So what you're saying is that Daniel Dixon has a resource where he can help people in just about any state purchase a property with no money down. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so but I think a the biggest plug. As a shameless plug, I think you should just leave your phone number right now to Not make my phone sure. Number. Okay, <laughs> a, a phone they number. Can get it in the show notes. If you go to if you go to the color of money podcast dot com, okay. you'll get all the information you need. Yeah. Okay. Shoot beautiful. me a DM or whatnot. I can connect you with the people. I think that it's so okay. it's so important to to get your first piece of real estate, even if it's a condo. And utilize that over time to then continue to build this net worth. Because as you're doing your net worth tracker and you see that home value continue to appreciate month over month, even though your income's not appreciating, you're growing your net worth. It's the fastest Mm -hmm. way that we spiked our net worth with the amount of properties I bought over the first five years of being an agent. But I think the most important thing that you mentioned that maybe we didn't um, talk about long enough was how how to do that. So, okay, we get it. Net worth is your assets minus your liabilities. We want that number to be as high as possible, a positive number. Yeah. And you used you talked about using a tracker in order to do that. And you're gonna we're gonna have the tracker in the uh, show notes. So if yes. y'all go to the Color of Money Podcast uh, dot com, you can get you can access the the show notes um, that will help us do that. But uh, if I'm listening to this and I'm one of the general population of people that have a negative net worth, what is the first thing I should do to increase my net worth? And I just can't run out and buy a house today. That's just not going to be my reality. Yeah. What should I do? The, the number one thing you need to do is pay off your credit cards because the credit cards are doing two things for you. A, the interest rate's crazy high. And B, if those cards are maxed out or you're borrowing more than 33% of what the card is worth, meaning you have a $1,000 credit 
limit available and you're borrowing more than $300 on that credit card, then that credit card is, is absolutely destroying your credit every single month. So by you attacking your credit card debt, you're actually paying less interest over time, which is a massive win. And then you're going to see 30, 50, 70 point spikes in your credit score, which will get that credit score up that can then get you in a position to be able to qualify for your first home. Because we still need a minimum of 620 credit score to be able to purchase a home using one of these down payment programs. And the, the other end of that in getting rid of your debt, once you have changed your mindset subconsciously, it prepares you for the next step of building your net worth because you understand debt is not your path to worth. Yeah. You know, I'm going to um, put a little bit of a spin on, on this. I had made a post, I think yesterday or the day before that the real measure of uh, wealth is how much you're worth when you lose all your money. Right. Because there are other things other than money that actually would make someone worthy, if you will, you know, uh, net worth. And, and some of those are the, are value. And I, the reason I say that is because it's part of building income is um, knowing your value uh, and um, being able to capitalize on your value um, and knowing your worth, if you will, you know, not letting people underpay you or uh, take advantage of you or take your intellectual property and use it as for, you know, understanding even in the conversation of being able to get the income up so that you have a net worth is first understanding what your worth is. What are you good at? You know, what, what do you have that you could sell? I am a huge fan of trade schools. We're talking about these student loans, right? People having all these student loans. I am a huge fan of people are always going to need an electrician. Somebody, they always going to need their hair done, right? People are always going to need, you know, somebody who can, once you have a skill, nobody can take that from you. And you can capitalize on that and build a business off of your personal worth and your personal value. So I think part of the net worth conversation is getting your worth up as a, as a person. Aside from the money, what are you good at? What are you skilled at? What trade do you have that nobody can take from you that you can capitalize on? That's part of the conversation to me. Well, yeah, I agree. It, it's a, go ahead, Daniel. To piggyback on that, I think when you think about going to college, it, what's underused um, that we, we, me and my wife used significantly was community college. You don't have to go to a four-year to get the skills and get the trades and get the, um, the associate's degree and get some of the fundamentals that you need that will help you in life. That's not going to be the $40,000, $60,000 a year tuition. So utilizing your community colleges, utilizing the grants, utilizing community college to find the trade, or you know what? I'm 18, Julia, and I don't know what I'm good at. Well, hey, let's go start learning and start trying some things and touching some things and understanding what that value is what my worth is in that sense, and then go create a career with it. Last week, Emmerich and I were at a conference, and uh, I told you, Emmerich, when I was talking to those young people, I said, um, I called out one of the boys. I said, what are you good at? He said, I hustle. That's what he said. I'm a hustler. I, I know how to hustle. I said, cool, me too. Uh, what, what do you want to hustle that is illegal? Like, tell me something legal that you like, that you want to sell. He was like, and he was like, shoes. But the reality was this child is an entrepreneur. Right. And he had a, a skill set that he had that he is a salesperson and he wanted to, you know, it's like so those kind of things. It's like I learned in the in the pandemic, especially when a lot of people lost their jobs and they were panicked about losing their jobs It's because you were relying on someone else for your value. They don't really have any skill sets other than um, I know how to do I know how to work for somebody, you know, um, but the people who actually had skill sets you know, and, and things that they could continue to do in spite of someone else. You don't have to worry about somebody firing you if you know that you have worth and value and you're good at something. Um, and so those kind of, those kind of things, but yeah, I like, I like, I introduced, I introduced him to Emmerich cause I said, Emmerich has the largest real estate company on the East coast, 600 agents in his office and they all hustle. So I want you to, I want to introduce you <laughs> to Emmerich <laughs> who could help you learn how to, how to hustle. I think that boy wanted to sell shoes or something like that. Emmerich, I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. He did. I, well, it's the one thing I want both of you to know that, um, you are not speaking the right language to those who are of the academia and they don't, a lot of them don't believe in the hustle. They believe that you go to school, get a degree and figure out how you're going to use that degree yes. to make That works for some a lot money. of people. That yeah. makes some money. I have a degree. That, that, it, it's that, working for me. <laughs> and, 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 here, and here's the deal. I'm, and I'm not saying anyway one thing or the other. 
that will secure you a job. That does not secure you a business. And so what you were saying, Julia, about get yourself a hustle, to wrap your brain around this, because I, I know a lot of people that have done this. They have their job, and then they have their hustle. They use their hustle to grow their wealth, and they use their job to maintain their lifestyle. It's the thing I that fuels that a, their passion, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Like you use a job. A lot of people actually sell real estate for that reason. They, they right. don't really like real estate. They use it because it makes them a lot of money and it fuels their passion or what else it is that they want to do, you know. It helps them with their big why. But I, yeah. I think that's a great idea what you said because, uh, as you said, and I was on a panel at that same conference, and the interesting thing is I said exactly what you said. I said, um, I have an electrical issue at my house. I have to call the electrician. He's going to charge me $150 to park his truck in front of my door. Just to show up. Just to show up. (laughs) And then, you know, as I thought about that, a friend of mine said, have a business. He said, the the issue with people in America is they use their time. They're addicted to using their time as the primary means to making money. They don't think about entrepreneurship enough and think about how do they use their skill as the primary means for accumulating wealth. And I thought that was really interesting. I don't don't want to go down this path and and challenge Mm -hmm. you guys too much, but I hate the word hustle. And I I don't think it's hustle. I think it's grind. I think it's work ethic. I think a lot of times, especially in our community, we we think about a hustle as a side hustle or a come up or something that we're going to do a little bit on the side versus grind. Like I I read this quote uh, years ago about part of being... Part of being successful in a CEO is you got to put the hustler to bed. You're a grinder well, now. You, you, and you so know what? I, I don't want to. I don't want to go too down right. on that, that yeah, rabbit right, hole. No, but yeah. I, I hate the word no. hustle. I agree no, with right. you. Yeah. It's 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 yeah. only a hustle until you learn how to do it the right way. When you don't know how to do it, it's a hustle. Once you understand how to do it, it's no longer a hustle. It becomes a business and a grind, just like you said. Because when you don't, don't know, you, wanna, you, I'm gonna be honest with y'all. I don't even want to grind. Uh, uh, that just sounds too kind. Of, I'm, I'm past, I feel like I'm past that age. I'm, that sounds exhausting. Um, Jason Abrams said uh, on our eight weeks to wealth class, he said, um, "Rich people buy time, right. and then when the yeah. richer they get, they buy other people's time, and we call those employees, right?" right. Um, yep. But but I don't even want to grind. I want to get to a position where my net worth, my money is making money, um, so that I don't have to work that hard. That's the whole mm-hmm. work smarter, not harder. The grind sounds exhausting to me. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but I think when you're getting when you're when you're starting from the beginning, you have to grind. Oh, you gotta you gotta yeah. put in the hours. You gotta yeah. you gotta do but the it is things. It's about work plan. ethic. It's definitely about work it ethic, is. like you said. Yeah. There's no shortcuts to success. It's hard yeah. work. <laughs> and, and it's you, just and what it is. It, unless you come up with like the uh, the you know a little thing that you hold and the shakes. You know, yeah. the little thing that you had. Unless <laughs> you have that thing or like. Yeah some crazy little widget that you can create by being an entrepreneur and an inventor. But outside of that, like you gotta, you gotta wake up every day. You gotta put your, put your game face on, lace up your boots and go do whatever you do very, very well. Whether that is a plumber or an electrician or a doctor or whatever those things are, get your mind right, get your focus right. And then all the things will start falling in place. So long as you're paying attention. So and Daniel, so, in, in, I guess to wrap it up, what would you think we should leave our listeners with to know their net worth? Do the work. Go grab the grab the sheet that we're going to attach to this uh, to this episode. Track it. Set a set a, a calendar invite every first of the month. We started doing this with the brokerage, where the first of the month we send a mass text out to everybody. It's the first of the month. It's time. It's time to um, update your net worth sheet. And it's it sucks sometimes. <laughs> I know. I've been there. I've done it. But the more that you can see that. And the more that you can see where you're at and then start putting goals around where you want to get to, then starts cre- changing the mindset and the hunger and the ambition to then start changing the behaviors to fill the void of where you, want, where you are today versus where you want to get to. You have to be aware. I don't have anything else to add to that. I think that's a great closing. Right. And, and that, that, Daniel, is the key right there. You have to be aware. All of us have spent some time where we were not aware and it did not matter to us that much because 
clearly that you said whatever gets measured gets what, what's your thing daniel whatever, whatever you measure measured, you move whatever you measure you move and when you're not aware you're not measuring it and you're not moving it and you'll look up from year to year and that network tracker is going to be the same thing it's going to be exactly the same at the end of the year as it was at the beginning of the year and so what you said is just so accurate about visiting every day so Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave on this last one. So I heard this quote this morning. Now that football season's here, this is my happy place. Every Sunday, like, the world doesn't exist. I'm planted in front of a TV, multiple right. TVs in my house watching football. And right. one thing they said today, they're, they're, they're giving a lot of, uh, a lot of heartache to, to someone that, that I know that I think is an incredible coach, Coach Eric Bieniemy, And they're saying about him that he's too hard. And one of the things, he coached my best friend in college, and one of the things that he said before is, you are either growing or you are dying. You are not staying the same. Think about that. You're growing or you're dying. Keep pushing. You know, as I said, I've said the same thing. You're growing or you're dying. Take your pick. Take your pick. And do the work. <laughs> Take your pick. Yeah. All right, y'all. Well, awesome. thanks for... Thanks for tuning in to the Color of Money podcast. We hope to see you next week. Make sure you go to the sh to the link, thecolorofmoneypodcast.com, so you can grab that net worth tracker that Daniel talked about and uh, start on the journey. Whether it's whether you're negative or whether you're at zero, you got to know where you're starting from so you can grow so you're not dying. Thanks, Daniel. Cheers, guys. Follow the Color of Money podcast today and get notified when new episodes are released weekly. Be part of this transformative listening experience.